Another instalment in the FPL wildcard video series. This week, I've gone for midfielders. I've got 10 midfielders in this video that I think are in with a shout of being in your FPL team. Stick with me, and I'll take you through them. All right, first up, I don't think is any kind of major surprise. I've gone for Mo Salah. Um, He's got a great fixture run from 17 to 22 there. He's been fully rested during the World Cup, so he's going to be absolutely bang up for it returning to the Premier League. I expect him to start pretty much all of those games. In fact, I expect him to start all of them, and he'll likely play 90 minutes as well. Even though, obviously, his performance this season has been overshadowed by Haaland, I still think his numbers are pretty good. He's got 0.66 expected returns per 90, and it's broken down by goals and assists, as you can see there. And I just think with the World Cup rest, he'll be right bang up for it for um, for the start of the, the restart, basically. Um, and another thing to note about Salah, actually, and I didn't realise this, he hasn't taken a penalty for Liverpool in the Premier League this season. So all of these goals and assist stats are purely non-penalty. He's not had a single penalty this season. So, yeah, could get a few penalties in amongst those those six fixtures you see there. And, yeah, hopefully back amongst the points is Mo Salah. And, yeah, I think he's always an option for your FPL team, just based on his historical performances alone. He's still the same player that put in those those points figures of previous seasons. And I think this year, certainly after Boxing Day, it'll kick on and score loads of points for you. So Mo Salah, definitely worth a go in your team. So the next player on my list is a very much a like-for-like -like replacement for Mo Salah, basically. Um, comparing the two, I think De Bruyne probably has the better fixtures, purely because he's got a double game week in 20, really. I think the, the opposition is slightly easier for Salah, but obviously De Bruyne has that double game week in 20 factored in. Comparing their expected returns per 90, Salah sits on 0.66, as you just saw, and De Bruyne's on 0.68. So that means per 90 minutes, he's going to get you more returns. However... Salas is definitely more weighted towards expected goals, whereas De Bruyne is weighted more towards ex expected assists. And really, in totality, there's not too much difference. I mean, 0 0.66 to 0 0.68 is barely anything. And obviously, goals are more point yielding than assists in FPL. So I think Salah just in just probably wins the battle on expected returns. As well as this, like I mentioned, you know, De Bruyne's got a double game week in, in 20, which on face value looks really good. But he doesn't start every game for Man City. I know he's their best player. I think he's their club captain now as well. You can see in the armband, he's got the armband on that picture of him. I don't think he's going to start both of those games for double game week 20. I know it's Man United and Tottenham, but but City have got such a deep squad that I, I definitely see De Bruyne being rotated. So that means, do you trust, you know, do you risk De Bruyne starting those two games or do you just go for Salah, who you know pretty much is going to play every game, probably for 90 minutes? And he's also got the safety net of penalties as well. Obviously, now Haaland takes them out, the penalties for Man City. I'm just not sure De Bruyne is a better option than Salah, personally, but I can't not mention him, right? Because comparably, they're very similar and he's got a double game week. So, you know, De Bruyne's always going to be an option in FPL and I wouldn't want to talk anyone out of picking them. I just think for me personally... I think Salah edges it over De Bruyne in terms of a pick for FPL. Um, but that's for you to decide. I'm just presenting you with the facts to help you make your decisions. It's really hard to make a wildcard midfielders video without mentioning Miguel Almiron. Simply the fact that he's currently the highest scorer midfielder in the game and he's less than half the price of De Bruyne and Salah. There's just no way I can't mention him in this video. The guy was in a ridiculous run of form um, before the World Cup. He's obviously not playing at the World Cup either, so he's having a nice rest over the Christmas period, where hopefully he's doing lots of training and trying to improve his game even more. I was sceptical of this guy as to whether he could keep the purple patch going up until the World Cup, and I didn't actually buy him. Um, and he's absolutely killed me in that period. He's probably one of the reasons why I'm slightly less than, than uh, happy with my rank at the moment. But yeah, I, I just don't think you can ignore Miguel Almiron. I think he's going to be extremely popular. Um, and I, to be honest, I think you'd be pretty brave to go without him. Um, looking at those fixtures from 17 to 22 as well, I think they're pretty strong. There's an Arsenal game mixed in there, but I wouldn't rule Newcastle um, out from challenging Arsenal in that game. I think they're perfectly good enough that they could give Arsenal some problems. And yeah, Almiron's stats are off the chain, so... 0.57 goals per 90. That's up there with Salah and, and higher than De Bruyne's numbers. Obviously, he's the highest scorer mid in the game, so of course they're better. Um, I just don't think you could ignore the highest scorer mid in FPL for 5.8 million. 
Now, next up is a man that's currently challenging for the Golden Boot at the World Cup, and that's Marcus Rashford. I think quite a few cottoned on to the fact that he'll be playing up front um, towards the end of the period towards the World Cup and uh, gain some points from him. But I think in the period after the World Cup as well, he's looking like a really decent option. Man United have got some really good fixtures there. Um, and I know you can see there that Man City and Arsenal are mixed in, but Rashford has a p pretty good record against the likes of Man City and Arsenal. And like I said, I think su his style of play suits the bigger sides. We know that Arsenal and Man City like to play a high line. And that's where Rashford really manages to exploit defences, where he can sit on the halfway line against the defender, sprint in behind, get a long ball play to him by someone like Martinez or Fernandez, and then go through and score. That's Marcus Rashford's bread and butter. So I wouldn't want to let those fixtures put people off. In fact, I'd likely definitely start him against Man City and Arsenal. And then looking at the rest of the fixtures, you've got Forest, Wolves, Bournemouth and Palace. I think that's a really nice fixture run for him. Now... With Ronaldo leaving, obviously Martial does appear to be the first choice centre forward at United when um, when Ronaldo's obviously not there, he's, he's gone now. So he does still have a chance of playing up front. I think he'll probably be replaced in that position by Martial, but I think he's going to start based on his form. Jadon Sancho looks to be out of favour for United at the moment, albeit he is working on like an individual training plan to try and get him back up to speed. Um, but I do think that Rashford has probably earned himself a place in the United front three, alongside Anthony and Martial, not to be confused for the same player, obviously the right winger from Brazil. Um, and yeah, I, I think Marcus Rashford is looking really good, just in terms of underlying numbers as well. His expected returns per 90 sits at 0.54 which is really close to the likes of Salah and Kevin De Bruyne, who are much more expensive. I think just for those numbers alone, he's probably not been taking his chances either. I think his numbers at the moment are lower than his expected goals. And he's looked red hot at the World Cup. I think he's found his goal scoring form back. Hopefully he carries that across to United in the period after the World Cup. And hopefully he makes it into your FPL team too. This guy, Bukayo Saka, is currently in my FPL team. Um, I just don't think you could ignore what he's done this season so far. The fact that Arsenal are at the top of the league and he's not... They don't really have a talisman to Arsenal, but I think Saka is probably as close as you can get to a talisman. I also think the fact that Gabriel Jesus is now being confirmed out for three months, I think that ever increases... Saka's importance to the team which I think will only increase his attacking output looking at that run from 17 to 22 I'd say it's a decent fixture run what makes it great is I haven't shown it in this picture but in double they've got a double game week in game week 23 thing with Saka you don't have to worry about him being benched he's a pretty sure starter for Arsenal and he takes their penalties he's got 0.57 expected returns per 90 very similar to Rashford who we've just looked at who of course was very similar to Salah and Kevin De Bruyne Saka is significantly cheaper than Salah and De Bruyne and he's yeah obviously still a starter and he's on pens so he's got 10 returns in 14 Premier League games which I think is excellent I mean if you pick a guy that returns 10 out of 14 games I think you'd be pretty content with him and very happy to pay 8 million for him too and those are the underlying numbers there I just think Saka's a great option he's going to be the talisman really for Arsenal when Jesus is out the fixtures are nice he's got a double in 23 He's on penalties. I think he's a great option for your FPL team. All right, just a pre-warning. This video is going to be a little bit Arsenal heavy. Um, next up, we've got Gabriel Martinelli, as you can see there. Similar reasons, really, for, for Saka being picked. He's got great fixtures and a, a hidden double in 23. One thing I would say, and it's the reason he's cheaper than Saka, really, is that now it, I think Smith Rowe is expected to be back after the World Cup. So Martinelli does have a bit of competition in his position, but I think it's his place to lose as far as I'm concerned. You know, he's absolutely banging the goals in before the World Cup, playing really well for Arsenal. He's definitely first choice for that, that position on the left. The underlying numbers are really good. Again, not quite up there with Saka, but I think it justifies the price that he is. Um, and with that great fixture run, I think he's a great option in your team. Really, I think if I was... Um, if I was trying to buy a midfielder and I didn't already own Martinelli, I'd wait for the next option on my page. But I think this is more for managers that have had him since the start of the season, gained a lot of value from him. I don't think he's worth selling. Um, I think you just hold him based on the fixtures, the fantastic stats that he's got, and the fact that he's still first choice in his position. I think he's a great keep in FPL. Now, as I mentioned, the next Arsenal midfielder is Martin Odegaard. So looking at the underlying numbers, he, they are actually slightly better than Martinelli's. He's got 0.35 expected goals and 0.22 expected assists, eight returns in 13 Premier League games. 
it's very close. Martinelli has seven returns, 0.23 expected goals and 0.23 expected assists. So Martinelli is slightly below Odegaard in terms of underlying stats and he's 0.4 million more expensive. Another thing to consider with Odegaard as well is that he's now the Arsenal club captain, which would make me think that he's pretty much nailed to play every game, whereas there is a slight risk, I think certainly returning from the World Cup as well, is that Smith Rowe might start some games ahead of Martinelli. Whereas for Odegaard, obviously he's not gone to the World Cup, so he's going to be rested. I think the fact that he's club captain for Arsenal, he's going to play every game. So yeah, I think he's probably slightly more nailed than the Martinelli now. And I just think the fact he's 0.4 million cheaper probably makes him a better option. Um, not much more I need to say about Arsenal fixtures because I've gone through two Arsenal midfielders already, but it was one to throw in there. If you don't already own um, Martinelli or Odegaard, um, I definitely think it's worth buying Odegaard. He looks like a really good option. Um, I'd say in previous seasons, the one criticism was that he didn't really have much end product. I think that's gone away now. The fact that he's got eight returns in 13 Premier League games, I think sort of shuts the critics up really and he really has grown into that captaincy role for Arsenal so think Odegaard is a good option and you should definitely consider him for your FPL team. And then finally just a page of honourable mentions really. First one is Phil Foden. Um, He's always going to be an option in FPL. It's just whether you're brave enough to play the pep roulette really. I don't think he's as strong as Saka personally as a long-term option. Just think Saka's completely nailed. He takes the penalties. I think that just makes him a better option than Foden. I don't know what happened in the period before the World Cup. I think he might have done something to annoy Pep, which is why he wasn't wasn't playing in the Premier League. I think like most, I was absolutely um, done in by Pep, really. I was convinced that Foden was, was the best midfielder in the game. <clears throat> I think he actually became the highest scorer midfielder in FPL as well. And then he continued and didn't start the next two games after everyone transferred him in. So he absolutely trolled us all. Um, but he's still on my list as an honourable mention because you know that when Foden plays on that left wing for Man City, he gets amongst the goals and I think he's a great option. The only thing I would say is I think there are other players more nailed for than him, so I think that makes him an, an honourable mention rather than someone I absolutely recommend for your team. Next two, we've got Trossard. I just think his underlying numbers and performance this season has been really good. Only 7.1 million as well. I think he well and truly justifies his price. I think the Arsenal midfielders just edge it for their double game week and the fact that they're top of the league. But Trossard's really stepped it up this season and looked really good. And it would be hard for me to talk someone out of picking him in their team. So he makes the honourable mentions list. And then Andreas Pereira, he's got a double game week coming up, I believe in game week 19. He's gone up to 4.6 million, but I still think he's the best of that price category to have in your team. He's nailed to start for Fulham every week. He doesn't necessarily play 90 minutes, but he starts every game. and He takes all the corners, all the free kicks, and he's got a really good delivery on him as well. It seems that pretty much every corner that Andreas Pereira takes ends up on Mitrovic's head. It's just a case of whether Mitrovic can direct it into the goal or not. So he's looking like a great option. Unfortunately, whenever he's been in my team, he's done nothing. And then whenever I've benched him, he's scored points. He's absolutely done me in this season. But regardless, I think he's a great option for your team. I think I'll be picking him still for, as my bench option um, for the midfielders. And yeah, I, I still think he's worth having in your team. Well, and that concludes the video. I hope you found that useful and enjoyable. Quick run through of some FPL midfielders that I'd recommend. Towards the end of this video, you'll see a recommended couple of videos. I've covered goalkeepers and defenders so far. So this is the third one in the series and I'll be doing strikers in the coming days as well. So yeah, hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure you like the video and subscribe to the Golden Gold channel and I'll be back in a few days with another video. See you later.